Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Minister Pimentel, Ambassador Palaz, Minister Rabbit, distinguished guests and members, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's important session of the Council. Allow me first to make one of my usual announcements. Our next regular program will be Wednesday, July the 9th, at which Deputy Secretary of Commerce Clarence Brown will address the subject American Competitiveness, excuse me, competitiveness in a Global Economy. My pronunciation is almost as bad as our competitiveness. <laughs> <laughs> the Council's members are delighted to be joined this evening by Minister Pimentel, Ambassador Plaz, Minister Rabbi, distinguished citizens from the Republic of the Philippines, and strong American friends of that nation who are our guests this evening. <coughs> we all wish the Philippines well as it wrestles with the economic, social, and political problems. We do so as long-standing friends with very special historical ties. We are sensitive the difficulties confronting the Republic of the Philippines, and therefore are deeply interested in the subject of political change in the Philippines. We are honored to have with us this evening to discuss this theme, the Philippines' distinguished Minister of Local Government. Among his particular responsibilities are the issues of replacing Marcos Merrill, and gubernatorial appointees and the communist insurgency. He has a special position in the future of the Philippines as chairman of the Filipino Democratic Party, Laban, and <clears throat> as a longtime political associate of the late Senator Aquino. Minister Pimentel is a former dean of the Ateneo Law School, a Jesuit <coughs> institution in Cagayan de Oro. A longtime opponent of the Marcos regime, he was elected to the Constitutional Convention in 1971 and jailed in 1972 for two years upon Marcos' declaration of martial law. In 1978, he was elected to the National Assembly and then jailed for a year. In 1980, he was elected mayor for Cagayan de Oro. In 1981, he was removed by Mr. Marcos, but was reinstated after popular protest. He was elected to the National Assembly in 1984, and shortly thereafter, removed by Mr. Marcos. In 1985, he was jailed upon returning from the United States after addressing the Council on Foreign Relations. <laughs> in 1982, he formed the Filipino Democratic Party, which was consolidated with remnants of Mr. Aquino's Laban Party. He has been chairman of the Filipino Democratic Party Laban, the party of Mrs. Aquino, since that time. For a most authoritative treatment of the subject of political change in the Philippines, I am pleased and honored to introduce to you the Minister of Local Government of the Philippines, the Honorable Aquilino Pimentel, Jr. Thank you very much, Mr. Patterson, for your kind uh, introduction. You mentioned that I was jailed upon my return to the Philippines after addressing the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, it does make me apprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to address the Council on Foreign Affairs, but there's a difference. The Council on Foreign Affairs, that one was foreign relations. I suppose uh, times have changed also back home, and maybe I can go home uh, without the J. Dr. Bird. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, at the very outset, I'd like to present our ambassador, the new ambassador of the Philippines to the United States, to you, so that if you want to ask difficult questions after this point, you ask him. <laughs> and the Honorable Emmanuel Perez. <laughs> Ladies and 
ladies and gentlemen, I am sure that you have read much about the new Aquino government in the Republic of the Philippines. And I am sure you have seen extensive footages of people power, that revolution, joyous and bloodless, that unseated the dictator and installed the present dispensation in my country. Yet, what I have to tell you now concerns the succeeding days after the euphoria, after the rejoicing, comes the inevitable task of rebuilding a shattered economy. As a cabinet member of the barely four-month-old Aquino government, I would like to give you a first-hand account of the current Philippine situation, its past and present problems, and our hopes and aspirations for the years to come. Briefly stated, <clears throat> the tremendous tasks the Aquino government has found compelling are, one, to revive an economy laid waste by the thunder and greed of the past government. Number two, to reform a political institution prostituted into serving the needs, whims, and the caprices of the deposed first couple and a few privileged families. And number three, to participate with dignity in the affairs of nations, particularly with those countries in the Pacific Basin and <coughs> Southeast Asia. Allow me to discuss these tasks in reverse order. As far as the countries in the Pacific Basin and Southeast Asia are concerned, economic growth has averaged 7.7% .7 annually. These countries, specifically Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Taiwan, are now the largest external market for agricultural produce of the United States. They are also the major suppliers of industrial raw materials of the United States. More particularly, seven of the top 20 trading partners of the U.S. come from this area. Japan ranking second, the ASEAN countries ranking altogether fourth, Taiwan sixth, and Korea seventh. Which only goes to show the growing importance of the region in the global economy. It is with this in mind that we would now focus on the only country in the region that has not performed at par with all the others, and that is my country, the Philippines. Among the ASEAN countries, the Philippines sticks out as a basket case of mismanagement and structural defects. The economy totally collapsed in 1984 when a 5.5% negative growth was registered and inflation soared to 50%, fueled by the combination of all the adverse economic factors, severe debt crisis, high interest rates, capital flight, foreign exchange shortage, and labor unrest. All this was triggered by the murder of Senator Benigno S. Aquino Jr. in 1983, but the event only served to accelerate the inevitable. The economy has been largely propped up by borrowings and stopgap measures. What precipitated the growth of these problems and serve as a stumbling block to any genuine economic reform was the widespread and large-scale corruption perpetrated by the Marcos regime and the economic favoritism that was accorded to their close friends or what has come to be known as cronyism. The result was a loss in business confidence and for as long as Mr. Marcos remained in power the problem could only continue unabated. But nothing remains permanent. And in the four glorious last days in February, the people, with the aid of a reform movement in the military, <coughs> took it upon themselves to end the dictatorship. Those were heady days, and many were the heartwarming incidents that took place. Allow me to recount two memorable ones. During the February 23 confrontation between tanks and unarmed civilians, an old lady knelt in front of the tank 
and implored, implored the soldier on top not to attack. The soldier went down, embraced the woman, and as his tears flowed, said he could never do such a thing because the woman reminded him of his mother. Another incident which many considered a miracle took place at dawn the following Monday. Marines advanced to less than a kilometer of the besieged reformist camp and threw tear gas canisters at a small crowd barricading the way. Many wavered, a few courageous souls stood fast, and when all seemed lost, the wind miraculously changed direction, and the tear gas blew towards the soldiers, forcing them to retreat. <laughs> of such courageous and miraculous feats was the Philippine Revolution of 1986 made. And now the task that lies ahead is to lead the country away from the economic morass of the decade-long dictatorship. And what have we inherited from this dictatorship? It remains difficult to quantify the extent of the damage done, but just to give you an idea, here are some mind-boggling facts. Number one, when Marcos came to power in 1966, 28% of the Filipinos lived below the poverty line. In 1975, this increased to 46%. And today it's 70 percent. Number two, real unemployment is from 15 to 20 percent, and the underemployment rate is 35 to 40 percent. Number three, manufacturing capacity of the Philippines is less than 50 percent utilized. Number four, our agricultural sector has not prospered under years of artificially low market prices. After 20 years, we can barely feed ourselves, and in some areas, the young children are experiencing severe malnutrition for the first time. Number five, our debt service payments for interest alone sold to U.S. $2.5 billion, more than 50% of our export earnings. As far as external debt is concerned, we rank 7th in size, 6th in debt to service ratio, 4th in debt to GDP ratio, and 9th in debt service ratio. The drag on the economy's capacity to grow is exacerbated by the fact that most of the loan financed projects were unproductive. Number 6. To make matters worse, we have incurred a major deficit during the first quarter of this year because of fiscal excesses during the elections. Initial estimates indicate a massive budget deficit of 40 billion pesos for 1986, which is three times the 1985 level unless drastic measures are taken both to increase tax revenues and reduce the funding requirements of government financial institutions. With such formidable economic problems, our development planners have agreed that the best solution is an overall economic program that emphasizes countryside development and agribusiness ventures. I have been informed by our development experts that Taiwan can serve as a model for agricultural growth and diversification that will in turn be balanced by our medium-scale, labor-intensive industrial base. The examples of Taiwan, Thailand, and Malaysia were in a deliberate program to develop agri-based exports away from the staples proved successful over three decades and resulted in marked improvement in agricultural income. Ideally, the thrust toward the countryside should also address attendant socio-economic problems that festered during the deposed regime, such as 1. Urban congestion. Job opportunities in the countryside should also aim to disperse population. Number 2. Unemployment and underemployment. Labor-intensive agri-based enterprises 
should be given emphasis. Number three, mass poverty and increase in real income should be based on stable market prices of the produce. Number four, rural insurgency, tenancy and exploitation, one of the root causes of insurgency must be addressed with a genuine land reform program. It is the Aquino government's commitment to alleviate the economic imbalances that were obtained due to self-serving and wrong-headed policies of the previous administration. That is why the political structure that we are putting into place and the people that man it are putting into the new economic program that will be set into motion by our government. And so that economic program will now be in place momentarily. Now you may ask, what is this political structure that I am referring to? And how does it dovetail with our countryside development? The answer is found in the exploitative structures set up by the dictatorship and the cable of cronies, bureaucrats and petty officials who conspired with him. During the Marcos years, the mechanisms for the plunder of the economy were institutionalized through an economic political bureaucracy that fed the greed of the dictator and his cohorts. Within the context of that bureaucracy, the petty town mayor who collects bribes from illegal loggers becomes a party to the rape of the national patrimony. The provincial governor who distributes patronage and orchestrates the fraudulent elections and referenda becomes instrumental in the perpetuation of the regime. Thus, to get the economic recovery program off the ground, the Aquino government must first dismantle and replace this corruption-ridden and parasitic eco-political structure. It is within this understanding that the Aquino government has set about the task of appointing local government officials who become officers in charge of the towns, the cities, and the provinces, and the countryside that has borne the brunt of the regime's rapacity. And even as we are designating the OICs, the officers in charge of these towns, we are also in the process of replacing some of those who have to be replaced. In other words, the mechanism for changing the OICs whom we have appointed upon complaint of the population is being done as soon as feasible. The OICs and acting mayors and governors will be given the chance to prove their mettle and put the house, their houses in order in their respective localities. When elections will be held early next year, and I hope as early as November of this year, these appointive officers will be asked to resign 90 days before election day to submit to the democratic will of the people and thereby institutionalize reforms, both political and economic, that are stated by the Aquino government. All this is designed to ensure popular participation in the program of government and maximize the trickle and ripple effects of economic growth. So this is where we are now, ladies and gentlemen. In the midst of implementing countryside development program and shaping a political structure that would help it get off the ground by championing the causes and the interests of more varied segments of the population and giving them greater participation in the political process. The new political structure is critical, absolutely essential, since the broad participation it allows will arrest the rise and takeover of the country by those who advocate violence. And so, we are putting those plans into action. In the meantime, what have we accomplished in the first 100 days? The Aquino government can boast of a list of achievements, largely geared toward expanding the democratic space in which freedom can flourish. The litmus test of democracy is the exercise of freedom, and this the Aquino government 
has accomplished in its first 100 days. First, freedom for the people. The Aquino government has restored human rights and has dismantled the apparatus of terror that the Marcos regime operated. Number two, freedom of the press. Our press is once again the freest in all Asia. And I'd like to add, uh, I'm not very happy about that, but uh, this is one thing that we must allow in a free society. We would rather have a free press than a silenced one. Number three, freedom of the farmers. We have broken up the cartels that have controlled the price of farm produce and kept farmers in virtual bondage. Number four, freedom for the working class. We have restored all the rights of labor and have established new mechanisms by which disputes may be settled. Number five, freedom even for the military. The revolution renewed the bonds of the soldier with the people. Number six, freedom for the rebels. Ceasefire negotiations are underway and the disgruntled are now coming into the fold in trickles. The process, however, would require an economic component as part of the program we are about to implement. And number seven, freedom for the economy. We are slowly stepping out of the economic limbo. Our foreign currency reserves have increased the US $1.7 billion, 85% over uh, the last 100 days. A clear sign of confidence in the economy by those who have brought in their dollars back to the country. Which brings us now to the 12-point program that was enumerated by our Minister of Finance to the Asian Development Bank. The 12-point program of priorities is as follows. One, we will continue to strengthen our foreign reserve position and maintain a competitive exchange rate for the peso. A stable and competitive currency is critical for business to preserve confidence and prevent speculation. Number two, we will keep inflation under control. At the single digit level, where it benefits most the average Filipino. After 100 days, the inflation is down to 2.1% compared to 50% in 1984 and 20% in 1985. Number three, we will endeavor to bring down interest rates immediately to spur the economy into a positive growth pattern. Present rates have declined to 15 to 17% in May of 1986, down from 28% in February of this year, but we still want to lower it down further to 10, up to uh, 12%. Number four, we will stimulate activities by accelerating expenditures of all Asian Development Bank, World Bank, and bilateral loan-assisted uh, projects, majority of which are countryside-based. Number five, we will motivate the private sector to reassume its traditional role as the prime mover of the economy, a role which was preempted by crony capitalism under Mr. Marcos. Number six, we will provide incentives by which the private sector will be encouraged to repatriate capital from abroad into productive investments. Number seven, we will implement a trade liberalization program previously agreed upon with IMF World Bank with certain modifications so as not to dislocate certain industries or aggravate an already serious unemployment problem. Number eight, we will utilize labor-based technology as our major approach to employment promotion and poverty alleviation. Number nine, we will restructure and reorganize the Philippine National Bank and the Development Bank of the Philippines to restore their viability and reduce the scale of their operations to self-sustaining levels. We will liquidate non-performing assets of these institutions. Number 10, we will privatize most, if not all, of the government-owned commercial banks and public sector corporations as soon as we find private sector investors. Government will no longer compete 
with the private sector. <coughs> Number 11, we will propose to establish a long-term equity capital fund for agricultural development with the World Bank in line with our agricultural diver diversification program. Number 12, we will introduce policy reforms that will encourage local industries to improve quality and cost competitiveness. Investments will be encouraged in labor-intensive, rural-based, and small and medium-scale enterprises. For this priority program, we will need a lot of help, if only to undo the damage done by the Marcos regime. But we also do not want to be perennially foreign aid and foreign loan dependent. I would now like to show one area in which America can help us help ourselves. <coughs> that area is in trade liberalization. The Philippine Economic Recovery Program will hinge so much on its export trade and an obvious way for the U.S. to lay the ground for such recovery is increased trade liberalization. Not only the Philippines will benefit from this program, the growing interdependence of the Pacific Basin, of which the Philippines is a part, and the United States can only be mutually beneficial. With increased trade liberalization, our economic planners foresee improved markets for a wider base of agricultural exports. Coupled with this is a new industrial strategy that will be aligned with our comparative advantage in labor-intensive products. And we envision that we will expand production and exports of light consumer goods. Foreign exchange earnings from agricultural and labor-intensive manufactured goods will in turn finance the purchase of machinery and equipment in a virtual circle of economic expansion. All this can take place if the United States adapts an increased trade liberalization program with us. And so, I must exhort you, our trade partners, open your doors to us. Welcome our shoes, garments, and handicrafts. Welcome our copra, sugar, bananas, and tropical fruits. Welcome our semiconductors and furniture. Most of these goods use American raw materials and inputs with value added to provide our countrymen jobs and livelihood. <coughs> Even our agricultural produce require your fertilizers and pesticides and your farm technology too. We are a poor and plundered country. All we are asking you is to help us help ourselves. Give us a chance to work for our own recovery and development. Accept openly our agricultural and light industrial products into your country. As a nation, we have just recovered our pride and dignity, and we are now rediscovering our collective strength in the face of tremendous adversities. Just like that old woman who knelt in front of a tank and was embraced by the tank commander. Just like the courageous civilians who stood up to a tear gas attack until the wind changed direction to side with, the, uh, with them. Just like them all, we have been infected by the spirit of reconciliation and infused with the courage to restore our battered country to its feet. But our courageous efforts alone are not enough to rebuild our economy. Our countryside development <coughs> program needs export markets like your country for the products of our labor. The political structure that we are setting up to ensure broader participation by all levels of society and thus arrest the insidious growth of those who would supplant our democratic processes which flourished in the limited expression society of the Marcos regime will grind to a standstill if the economy does not recover. The critical factor in my country's progress at this point in time remains to be increased trade and foreign investment. Thus, you, as businessmen and leaders, can do a lot to help us. So come and visit our country. Trade with us. Invest in the Philippines. And help keep democracy alive in our country. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, you don't mention overpopulation.
population or population control as a problem. Is it a problem in the Philippines? The question is whether population, overpopulation, is a problem in the Philippines. <laughs> It's not really so much of a problem because the government uh, has always had a population control program in place, and uh, that program is still going on in the country today. Yes, sir. In your talk, I never once uh, heard anything concerning the basis of law that you're doing your uh, work from. Two points: yours is being a uh, dean of a uh, law school, for Don your alley. One, uh, as far as I know, President Marcos. Never resigned as president. I wonder how you're handling that to establish a position. You know? And two, your OICs and the mayors and the governors and the financial institution restructuring. What basis of law are you using? The uh, question is uh, what bases of law are being used by the current government with respect to its changes, specifically? Uh, <clears throat> the uh, fact that Mr. Marcus has not uh, resigned, and what is the uh, law which justifies putting in place the OIC? Mr. Marcos, sir, did not resign. He was never elected anyway. <laughs> uh, in effect, what I'm trying to say is that if Mr. Marcos was in power, it was because of fraud and violence which his government perpetrated upon our people. And so when he was ousted by people power uh, during the last February, uh, during the February uh, revolution, the accession of Mrs. Aquino is not so much based only on the four days of the revolution, but the fact that she was duly elected as president of our country, but was cheated only in the counting uh, done by the Batas and Pompasa, which is the, the parliament in our country. And uh, you are asking me what basis of uh, law are we using in the replacement of the uh, former local incumbents. Let me tell you, sir, that the local incumbents, uh, the mayors and the governors, were elected to a six-year term here on uh, March 3, 1980, and therefore six years thereafter is March 2, 1986. So by the time I got to be Minister of Local Government, the terms of office of all the uh, locally elected officials had expired. And therefore, they had no legal right to cling on to power one day longer. And so the law of necessity took over for us to replace them, because by necessity, we had to replace them for the reason that uh, Mrs. Aquino had to have a local base of support in order to make sure that her policies and programs would be implemented down to the lowest levels of government. And in the process here, I'd like to advert to the fact that we have promulgated a what we call a freedom constitution that is now in place, which will soon be supplanted by the constitution that is being framed by a constitutional commission, which hopefully will finish its work by September of this year, so that uh, by November of uh, 1986, if not by November, at, at the latest by February of 1987, we will have local elections for the people to decide who will be their leaders down to the last municipality and city and province of our country. Yes, sir. <clears throat> The uh, question is, uh, is the military establishment a problem for your government? And uh, if so, uh, what are you going to do about it? I'd like to assure you, sir, that uh, Mrs. Aquino is in full control of the situation in the Philippines, including the military. She has been accepted by 
the military establishment as their commander-in-chief, which he is. And uh, regarding the dismantling of the warlords you speak about, particularly in Mindanao, we have already started to do that. One of the most notorious cases is the case of a governor in Lano del Sur, whom we replaced, and for a time he refused to relinquish power. Well, we booted him out uh, without too much problem after a few shots were fired, of course, but uh, not, uh, not too much difficulty after that. In other words, Mrs. Aquino is gradually, but forcefully, asserting her leadership over the military, and uh, we do not see any problem regarding that matter. Yes, sir. <clears throat> the problems you presented, the things you're working on, are all very short term in a way compared to the power of money. You mentioned nothing about the education problems in the Philippines. <clears throat> what kind of educational system had you? Had you proposed to enlarge it that you can become a true democracy? Uh, with respect to longer term <clears throat> problems, would you comment upon the, the educational system in the Philippines, as it, particularly as it may support the evolution of democracy? Yes, um, the educational system in the Philippines is largely patterned after the American system. So we have um, English right from the first grade all the way up to college. And uh, we have a public sector in our educational uh, system which allows students to uh, get uh, education up to the university level at the um, minimal costs, but we have also a very strong private educational system and uh, most of the schools which are uh, quite famous in our, in our country uh, are run by Jesuits. Uh, I do not apologize for that because I am a Jesuit product myself, but uh, that is a fact. And so we both have a pub public sector and a private sector running the educational system. And uh, I think the new Minister of Education is trying to, uh, you know, redo the curriculum for all these uh, educational institutions so that we will have, uh, you know, uh, courses on uh, democratic practices and democratic <laughs> theories which will help sustain our democracy in the country. Yes, sir. Will you support uh, opposition party candidates fielding their tickets during your upcoming uh, elections? And uh, if so, under what uh, <coughs> limitations may, may these tickets be uh, presented? The question is, will opposition parties be allowed in the upcoming elections? <laughs> and if so, under what conditions? The opposition parties will all be allowed to participate in the elections. No conditions attached. Uh, the only condition probably will be for them not to advocate the use of violence. But aside from that, everyone will be welcome to try their luck in the political arena. Including Mr. Marcos? Uh, Mr. Marcos will have certain problems because he's facing uh, numerous cases which might effectively prevent his coming home. I think you were next, Mr. Bumper. Uh, two very short questions. One, is there any parallel between uh, Mrs. Aquino's former husband's trip to the hills to invite Louis Farouk to come back and her current efforts to try and bring the uh, search phase of the second very short question. <coughs> Is there any uh, land reform program? The uh, first question was whether there was any connection between. Uh, uh, was, what are this? <coughs> was there any parallelism between the uh, efforts of Mrs. Aquino's former husband to uh, reconcile problems with the communist insurgency and Mrs. Aquino's uh, efforts to do so? The second question uh, was whether there was a land reform program under consideration. Well, for a short backgrounder, um, the, the late Senator Benigno Aquino, when he was still a, a cub reporter of a newspaper in the Philippines, negotiated the surrender of the uh, hook supremacy, the, the communist uh, 
commander in the 1950s, and uh, he was able to bring him down to, to make him surrender. And so um, I think that there is some parallelism here. Mrs. Aquino uh, believes in negotiating first, even with the communist insurgents, to try to make them come to the fold of the law. We believe in exhausting all possibilities before uh, shooting it out with our own fellow Filipinos. And so, uh, by the way, I'd like to advert to the fact that contrary to some misimpressions being created in uh, media, I've read some uh, reports from, from U.S. Uh, newspapers which tend to belittle the effects of the call of ceasefire and uh, negotiations by Mrs. Aquino. I'd like to assure you that the call for ceasefire and uh, negotiations with the rebels is bearing positive uh, results. In my own home province alone, which is the province of Misamis Oriental, that used to be a hotbed of insurgency during the days of Mr. Marcos. But we put in a new a young man who is now officer in charge as governor of the province by the name of Vicente Emano. And he has effected a working ceasefire with the rebels, and uh, this, the formula was approved by the military, supported by the church too. And so, on the basis of his own initiative, he brought down about at least three top rebel commanders in that area, and the hundreds of farmers who could not work their farms in the days of Mr. Marcos and what could be evacuated because of intense fighting in that area, are now back in their farms. And uh, I'd like to add that there are several mayors and governors who have reported to me that several other uh, rebel commanders and uh, rebel followers have indicated their desire to surrender as uh, in response to the call of Mrs. Aquino for a ceasefire and reconciliation. Now, regarding the second question, is there a land reform program being put up? Yes, there is a land reform program that Mrs. Aquino is initiating. And uh, the difference between her land reform and the land reform of Mr. Marcos may lie in the fact that we want to support uh, the, the beneficiaries of the land reform program with all the inputs that uh, are needed to make their ownership viable. Because our experience with the Marcos land reform program was that after the so-called uh, uh, land reform program was put into effect and the land areas were divided. The, the tenants which got the land no longer got, uh, no longer received the support of the government, but in terms of farm inputs and other, other necessities to, to make the ownership viable. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Pimontel, uh, has your program of replacing local officials reached into the barangays? Have you uh, started to replace barangay captains? <coughs> The question is, has the, land, has the uh, replacement of officials uh, reached into the barangay? There is no intention to replace the barangay uh, leaders. Uh, a policy statement to that effect will probably be given by the president herself, whether or not to replace them, but as of the moment, uh, we have not touched any of the barangay leaders. Yes, sir. Uh, we know that the Philippines were a possession of Spain for about 400 years, and of course the Spanish culture, religion, left a tremendous imprint on the peoples of the island. Yet we're also aware that a large minority of Muslim, and I assume a large minority of primitive tribal people. Do you anticipate any problems, or how are you dealing with these minorities? <coughs> question is, are there minority problems in the Philippines which uh, trouble you? <laughs> Out of a population of about uh, 50, 52 million Filipinos now, <clears throat> we have roughly 4 million Muslims and uh, maybe a few hundred thousands of uh, tribal, tribal Filipinos, we call them. <clears throat> We are dealing with the Muslim problem uh, quite successfully, I think. We have established, of course, the Ministry of 
Muslim culture, Muslim affairs, uh, along with another ministry to deal with uh, tribal Filipino affairs. And uh, the, the real problem, if at all they start acting up again, would come from the so-called Moro National Liberation Front, which uh, fought the Marcos regime uh, throughout the long years of his incumbency. And uh, as of now, there is also an effective ceasefire between the MNLF, that's the Muslim National Liberation Front, and the Philippine government. And negotiations are going on to find a just and lasting solution to the Muslim problem in the Philippines. Yes, sir. Uh, Minister Pimentel, I have a very easy question. Uh, it's entirely practical. And it's in response to your suggestion that one thing that the United States can do to help uh, the new administration in the Philippines is to expand trade. I don't have a lot of experience in trade with the Philippines, but I've been there a couple of times. And most of the trading companies and uh, industrial concerns and ministries of the government uh, claimed as evidence of their legitimacy in the past their close uh, yes. proximity <coughs> to President Marcos and his uh, group. I, I just wonder how uh, we can communicate now on trade issues with the Philippines uh, effectively, or whether that whole group has been dismantled or replaced in your country. The, the easy question <laughs> is, uh, how can uh, people who wish to trade with the Philippines consider it a, a relatively easy thing to do if, in fact, in the past, the uh, trading companies and government ministries with which they had to deal claimed that their uh, great uh, leverage was because they uh, had access to President Marcos? Yes, uh, all of that we lumped together under the term cronyism. So, uh, that has since been dismantled, by the way. The coconut monopoly uh, run by a crony of Mr. Marcos has been dismantled. The sugar monopoly run by another crony has been dismantled. And so have a lot of other business uh, enterprises that uh, used to be associated by favoritism uh, with the regime of Mr. Marcos. As a matter of fact, maybe you've heard uh, that some of the shares of these uh, favorite few of Mr. Marcos have been uh, actually sequestered by the government. Yes, sir. Against the wall. One of the main The uh, two questions are, first, what is the government doing to root out graft and corruption? And secondly, what is it doing to encourage foreign investment? Regarding graft and corruption, the government is waging a relentless fight against it in all forms. And I, I would uh, venture to suggest that uh, this effort is now succeeding as uh, verified to me by some of our fellow compatriots who are living in the United States and who have gone back. Whereas before, upon arrival at the airport, uh, they would already be victimized by customs collectors or immigration officials. They don't see that anymore. It's no longer there. And uh, that is true also with all other government agencies. And the moment uh, anyone would report with some substantiation that a particular official is committing crap, then certainly that official will be put out by President Aquino. That is her commitment. Then secondly, regarding foreign investments, yes, Mrs. Aquino is encouraging foreign investors to come in into the country and uh, with guarantees of uh, profit and capital repatriation. Yes, ma'am, the corner. What 
uh, government structure and presumably government programs, do you have to root out uh, the uh, health and poverty problems which you identified earlier? The health and poverty problems cannot be alleviated by only one ministry. It's a total effort of government. However, we have some ministries that are uh, actually uh, doing something directly and immediately to combat you know, the problem of uh, sickness and poverty and more people. We have the Ministry of Social Services and we have the Ministry of Health. But then again, um, we, uh, these ministries are, of course, uh, you know, saddled by the problem of lack of funds and um, the like. And that is why in our talks with uh, the Filipino community here in the United States, we have stressed the fact that on their own they can already do something. We can send much needed uh, medical supplies and uh, medical facilities even to our country to immediately attack uh, the problem of either. Yes, ma'am. And if you have a problem, please uh, call on our ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> you will uh, need you for the proper Yes, sir. Uh, does the uh, Kino government desire to see a uh, continued strong American military presence in the Philippines, in the particular uh, Subic Bay and the uh, large Air Force Base? And if so, why? And if not, why? <laughs> does the uh, present government of the Philippines continue, wish to see a continued American military presence, uh, for example, at Subic Bay and Clark Air Base? This is Aquino's position, which he you know, explicitly stated during the campaign was that she is for the uh, for the Filipinos to respect the existence of the military basis until uh, the term, the expiry date of uh, the contract, and then from there we renegotiate. So that is the position of uh, Mrs. Aquino. I think the question also included uh, uh, if there were reservations. What were they? I should have added that on in the first place. Um, I would not want to preempt uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Aquino's thinking on this matter. I would rather that uh, on this sensitive issue, uh, she addressed this herself, or if not she, then our ambassador in Washington can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulate you. So, I think it's a very fine exposition you made of your country. It's a very beautiful country. I lived there for six years, worked there, and enjoyed it. I was told when I went there that you should never take your wife to the Philippines because it's like taking a sandwich to a banquet. <laughs> However, I took my wife and children there, and we enjoyed ourselves immensely. Uh, I particularly enjoyed in working in Mindanao, Tagandoro, Marawi, Iligan, and uh, in your province. Um, I would like to ask a question uh, following up the one on foreign investment. You mentioned about your encouraging foreign investment. To what extent have you had success in that field? From which countries? And uh, what further <coughs> efforts are you directing? With respect to uh, foreign investments, uh, with what countries have you had success and what are your further encouragements? We have been uh, barely in office for 100 years, sir, and uh, uh, we have not had too much experience along this line. But in that short span of time, we have a lot of uh, American businessmen who have already approached our ambassador here and who have uh, indicated to him their desire to come into the Philippines with uh, investments. And I'm sure that there are any number of European countries which have already gone to our country and made their own surveys. And of course, the Japanese are already there and, and are continuing with their investments. So I think that we are on the right road. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, during the election, um, <coughs> the complexities of dealing with 7,000 islands of communication <coughs> were brought home to us. Um, I'm wondering now what kind of communication channels you've established from Manila out to the provinces and the various OICs that you've appointed there, and also how the problems and 
potential problem OICs, how that's being addressed, how that gets back to Manila, and how the problem is justified. Would you comment upon the uh, difficulties of internal communication for the government of the Philippines, given its dispersed uh, geographic character? We have a network of uh, radio communications in my ministry, Ministry of Local Governments, uh, which is based in Manila, and would have outlets in uh, at least on the regional level. So basically, that is our main main line of communication. And uh, as Minister of Local Governments, I also make it a point that out of seven days <coughs> in the week, I am out in the provinces for at least four. I visit various uh, towns and provinces in the entire country to get the pulse of the people directly. Yes, sir. <coughs> According to the papers, uh, when Aquino, I mean, when Marcos arrived in the state, the uh, Customs Department had paid some of his possessions. <coughs> Now, since, the, since then, the federal judge, I understand, has released uh, these items that were detained. Now, if our federal judges and courts keep on releasing things, how are you going to obtain your money? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the question is, uh, please comment upon some of the difficulties of recouping some of the uh, money which Mr. Marcos has acquired uh, over the past yes. decade. Uh, I'd like to say that happily, the $7 million that were um, ordered released by Judge Fong, I think, of the Hawaii court, is merely the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more hidden somewhere, and we are certainly going after that. Now, regarding the $7 million, uh, we are questioning the decision of Judge Fong, I think, uh, in the higher courts. and. Uh, Hopefully, we will be able to stop the release of this amount. <coughs> Nevertheless, I'd like to say that our uh, government officials who are in charge of this investigation into the hidden world of Mr. Marcos are panning out all over the, the globe, uh, up to Europe and uh, Switzerland and uh, Geneva and all, all those places. And uh, they, have, they are making good... Uh, advances into the recovery of the monies of uh, Mr. Marcos, which he spirited away from the country during the regime. Yes, sir. To what extent does Philippine foreign policy affect internal politics in the Philippines? Did you comment upon the impact of foreign policy upon internal policy in the Philippines? Well, the foreign, the foreign policies of our country naturally have a bearing on uh, what we do in our own country. However, as of now, our dom domestic problems take priority uh, to our attention. We have to immediately combat the fact of uh, the need for more money for our economic development, the need for to combat uh, poverty and uh, the insurgency right there in our country internally. So uh, our foreign policy so far has been to be friends to all and be enemies of none. And, uh, we hope that uh, Mr. Pelais, who is amb our ambassador here, can articulate that uh, uh, that attention or that uh, trust uh, in some future time, and uh, you will get a fuller picture of it from him, I, I, I suppose, and I hope. <coughs> the information that I've received out of the Philippines that since you've been in office, between 600 and 700 people have either been assassinated or executed. It's in providence that they're not in charge of. Will you bring those people to trial after you have consolidated your hold on the country? The uh, factual statement was that there have been a large number of assassinations in the Philippines in the past few months. The question is, if that's true, uh, what will you do to bring the guilty to justice? All, all people who, all persons who violate the law will be made to answer for their misdeeds. That is the primary thrust of the government of Mrs. Aquino. And uh, certainly, these political killings will be investigated, and those guilty will be punished. Yes, sir. 
I'm getting back to foreign investment in the Philippines. I believe under the Marcos regime, you had a law in effect which prevented foreign investors to own more than 40 percent of the equity of the new uniform corporation. Uh, how is this going to be addressed by the new government? The question pertaining to uh, foreign investment is, uh, will the present government be more relaxed in its restrictions upon <coughs> foreign investment than was the Marcos regime? Specifically, the Marcos regime had a 40% limitation on ownership by uh, foreigners, uh, that is ownership in new companies, and will that be more liberal in the present regime? Basically, I don't think there will be much change regarding the limitation of, uh, of foreign ownership, especially in areas which pertain to the exploitation and development of our natural resources. But in all other areas, I think there will be a liberalization. And one thing you can be sure of, the rules will be clear and specific and will not change from day to day, as they happened under the Marcos regime. <coughs> You could ask that about anywhere, I suppose, in the world, is what's happening in political science departments. But the, the question was, what, is, uh, what was happening during the Marcos regime in the universities, uh, such as the political science departments? There was certainly a lot of ferment in the universities, and uh, particularly the University of the Philippines, uh, Ateneo de Manila University, among others, were leaders in, uh, you know, formulating philosophical and, uh, uh, you know, socio-economic issues against uh, the Marcos regime. And I know for a fact that there were a lot of professors who were incarcerated as a result of their pronouncements against the Marcos regime, even in their classroom, because at that time, there were any number of uh, secret agents which were enrolled in the various courses in the, in the universities, trying to monitor, you know, the thinking and the teaching of these professors. And so uh, it was quite a difficult situation for those who believe in freedom of education. Yes, sir. It's uh, sugar and basic uh, crop of the Philippines, and it's sold uh, with its weakness on the world market. What's uh, uh, the Filipino uh, idea of solving this problem? <coughs> <laughs> the, the factual question is, is sugar very important to the Philippine economy? And the uh, uh, second question is, uh, if it is, if sugar prices indeed are weak on the international economy, what does that do to the prospects for the Philippines? We are certainly hoping that, uh, among others, just talking about sugar, that our former quota in the American market should be restored. It used to be 27% of the available sugar um, importation of the United States. This was reduced to 13% uh, effective some um, two or three years ago. And so um, regarding the sugar exports of our country, we're hoping that somehow the sugar quota for the Philippines, which on the average was 27%, would be restored so that it can help uh, our country generate uh, uh, foreign exchange earnings. Now, aside from copra, we are also, uh, we have several other exports like logs and uh, copra, but even these are also affected by a worldwide uh, drop in the demand for these things. So the picture is really rather difficult for us. Mrs. Riggs? <clears throat> Yesterday, the American newspapers reported that Reagan, the Reagan government warned former President Marcos against participating in Philippine politics from America. To what extent is Marcos able to call upon his former supporters and in the Philippines? And is it an extent which deeply concerns you? The uh, Reagan administration re recently warned Mr. Marcos not to participate 
or try to participate in local Philippine politics. The question is, to what extent uh, is Mr. Marcos indeed able to call upon supporters in the Philippines? We have a very good telephone connections between Hawaii and Manila. It's calling in Manila every day. <laughs> but uh, in all honesty, we're not worried about that. I think everything is under control. And Mr. Marcos is certainly losing his hold on his followers. Uh, I'll give you a specific example. Blas Ople, who used to be Minister of Labor under Mr. Marcos, has broken away from Mr. Marcos and uh, has, uh, has accepted an appointment by Mrs. Aquino to the Constitutional Commission, despite pleadings by Mr. Marcos to the contrary. Mr. Marcos has called him and asked him, look, uh, I have the goods on you. Uh, don't, you don't you abandon me? But uh, nevertheless, he has you know, shunted aside uh, his allegiance to Mr. Marcos and is now working with the Aquino government. That is only one example, and uh, there are several others. The uh, demonstrations, for example, which are being mounted by the so-called Marcos loyalists against Mr. Aquino are, instead of increasing in number, are actually dwindling in size. So, uh, and in so far as we are concerned, as long as they do not resort to violence, they can have the demonstrations every day if they want to. That is part of the democratic process. <coughs> Unfortunately, our, our time is up. We, we try to uh, limit ourselves very rigidly to uh, stopping at 10 minutes after 7. To those of you who have